the accounting functions are just, it's your dashboard of understanding like how the business is doing health-wise. Business of Architecture, episode 258. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, head on over to freearchitectgift.com to get instant access to my free four-part architecture firm, Profit Map. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Software and SageGlass. BQE Core is the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. You can get a free trial as a Business of Architecture subscriber or listener by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. SageGlass, you may have heard of them. They manufacture highly intelligent and reliable dynamic glass. You know, the kind of glass that you can change the opacity of it just by pressing a button or even from an app on your phone. SageGlass tends automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare and manage heat, and it maintains the design flexibility that you want to have as a designer. Visit sageglass.com to see the future of the built environment for yourself. In today's episode of the Business of Architecture, we talk with the founder of Alliance Architecture, who we had the opportunity to speak with last week. Now, Alliance Architecture is a firm with offices in D.C., Washington, D.C., in the United States, Maryland, and in North Carolina. In this episode, we speak with the founder, John Warasilla, and he talks about the importance of knowing your numbers in the firm and how he's built a substantial real estate portfolio by actually getting a piece of the action and investing in both his own and in his clients' projects. So if you're looking for ways to be inspired to grow your practice to be more profitable or to take on a little bit of the entrepreneurial venture where you can get a piece of the action, you are going to love my conversation with John Warasilla. So here's the show. So we've, we've touched on leadership. We talked about the meeting. You know, how what things are you doing in the firm? I can tell culture is very important to you, John. What things are you doing to instill the kind of culture you want to see in the firm? Um, for a lot of it, to me, it's like leading by example, right? I mean, it, I, it's, I think people, I think it's hard to recognize as a leader how much weight you carry um, in terms of like people are watching everything you do in a good way, right? And so you've got to be pretty conscious of the language you use, the way you phrase questions. Um, you know, if there's things that I encounter that are exciting, I try and bring them back to everyone and share them. I, fortunately, I get to travel a fair amount in my practice. So if I see some great project in, in Chicago or, or Seattle, I'll take images of it and bring it back and say, hey, look, I think this is really interesting. We should be thinking about this, you know, and and so it's really, to me, the biggest cultural thing I want to introduce to people is it should be fun, have curiosity, um, be entrepreneurial. It's okay to make money doing this. It's, you know, that's, that's why we're here. It's part of why we're here. So, you know, don't, you know, don't be afraid to take chances either. Like, I really love when people will come to me with, you know, hey, I have a friend that I think is going to open a restaurant, you know, what do you think about that? And to me, that discussion off is, isn't so much about design. It's about like what I've learned about working with people who are great restaurateurs, you know, and just, you know, you're trying to get people involved in business in that it's not this foreign, like bad thing, but it's like, it, it, it can be really fun and productive and, and rewarding. So, Awesome. You, you said here that you like to demonstrate and uh, how and focus, uh, demonstrate on how everyone, uh, okay, Sorry, demonstrate how everyone can and focus on making everyone rich experientially, socially, and monetarily. Tell me about that, John. Okay, so so first of all, we when I came to Durham, the city was abandoned. I mean, I encountered a city where it's like, what happened? It's like tobacco industry died. There's all these buildings that are here that are empty the streets, but it's an, it's a it's a city like where all the people just disappeared. And I had a chance early in my career to work in Baltimore and I'd keep going back to Baltimore over a period of maybe 15 years or so when I was in, after I'd moved to DC and I saw them rebuild a whole city. And I said to myself, if I ever see that again, I want to get immersed in that. 
And so when I came to Durham, I said, this is like Baltimore was in 1980. It's like all the buildings were here, but there's nobody here. So I found out, I found the economic development organization that was uh, a private, uh, public private partnership, downtown Durham, Inc. Uh, went and met them and said, what's, what's the plan here? How are, what's, how, are, how are people dealing with this? And so they said, well, we're essentially the last people in the room and we're going to rebuild this city. And uh, I said, well, this sounds great. Let me get involved. And, and I got involved. I became chair of that organization. I was on their executive committee for 10 years. And, and over that period of time, as an architect, I always was disappointed when my uh, bosses would come back from a meeting and say, oh, well, we had this great idea, but the developer didn't like it, so we're going to do this instead. And I thought, well, you know, the way to get around that is to own your own projects or own your own buildings. And if you believe in that idea that strongly, then make it, make it work, you know, execute it and do it. And so, you know, we ended up buying and own about 10 buildings in downtown Durham, which we've renovated. And they're, um, they've been highly successful and we've transformed this whole downtown a really key part of rebuilding the city. And that's where I mean by leading by example, right? It's, and, and that I've tried to show the people in our office, like, look, you can get paid as an architect, but you can make a lot, a lot of money as well, you know, investing in your projects. So we pretty consciously also look for, project opportunities where the developer or the owner is open to us, you know, saying, look, we would, we, we would like to invest in this project as well, not just as culturally in terms of designers, but we'll, you know, we'll write a check into this. We want a stake in this. And I want my people to, to, to also have a culture of like stakeholding, right. You know, get involved, you know, so. So what does that conversation look like? I mean, say I'm an investor and, and we're thinking about hiring you guys for architects. You guys come to us and you say, hey, yeah, we'd, we'd like to get be partners in this. You know, are we talking? Tell me about the typical arrangements. How could an architect who's thinking about that make that happen? Uh, well, generally the way that's happened is you ask, right? Like, it, you know, are you looking for further investment in this project? You know, and a lot of times people would say, sure, you know. And, and for a lot of our clients, too, that on the development side, it's very powerful for them to be able to say, well, our architects are stakeholders in this too. You know, it's like, it, it's all of a sudden everyone in the room has a lot more credibility because you're not just hired as like a, a consultant. You're no, you're in it, you're in this game and, and you want to have a great outcome for everybody. So, um, and, and people in my office have, you know, often they're now looking at, Hey, are there, you know, what neighborhoods would you look at to start to buy houses in? Where do you think the opportunities are in that? And so, it's, it's definitely taking root. I mean, the, those people are definitely thinking in terms of things beyond just coming in and doing a set of drawings or about how, to, how do you build a life in this that's also a business and a career. So. Give me a good example of a project like that that you invested in so we can talk about that. Well, so a really good project that uh, we in, well, one we're actively involved in now is in East Durham, it's an old, it's the last textile campus in Durham being redeveloped. LRC, who is a large developer out of New York, uh, we'd worked with them in a project in Raleigh and they, they came across this project and they called and they said, do you know this property? And I said, yes, absolutely. I know that property. And uh, they said, would you meet us there and look at it with us? And we went and looked at it and they said, what do you think? I said, I think this is an opportunity to transform this entire east side of town. I mean, this this can be the anchor that catalyzes the entire neighborhood around it. And uh, they said, you know, okay, well, I think we're going to buy it. So they, you know, were fortunate in that they acquired the property. And then they said, you know, would you, you know, do, do you want to invest in this? And I said, sure. So we wrote them a check for $100,000 and you know, our stakeholders in it. We have a very small part of it, but, um, but it makes us, I, I think we'd always want to do a terrific job anyway, but when you know that, you know, you're part of the, the financial side of it too, you really have an, an approach to it. I think that's like, look, this has to be as good and as, you know, terrific as it can possibly be because it's going to reflect on us, not just as architects and designers, but as, uh, stakeholders too. So, so 
project's moving along pretty well. That $100,000, is that a cash check or have you ever taken your leverage as fees leverage that into the project instead of providing cash contribution? Um, I haven't. I've thought about it. I, I tell you the really interesting one that came about, and this was listening to your discussion with Blair a couple of weeks back is, so the tax credits on a project like that, you know, a big project like that can be worth, you know, 10, $15 million, right? And I know how to do that really well. So instead of getting paid as an architect hourly to produce, you know, whatever documentation package it takes to do that, I'm really intrigued with the idea of saying, look, we'll, we'll get you the tax credits on this. And in exchange, we want 5% of the value the tax credits, you know, generate. And in that context, the numbers are really terrific. And what's terrific about it is the tax credits are kind of made up money, right? It's not like someone's writing a check. I mean, down the line, people are writing checks for it. But in the beginning, it's really about understanding how to do a tax credit project and seeing the value in it and then lining up, you know, the process to do that. And getting a percentage of that, to me, is a lot stronger than getting paid a fee to just deliver the documents to do that. So That's pretty awesome. Uh, here in my notes, it says that you, 2005, developed and invested in eight buildings forming a neighborhood. Tell me, was that your first project that you uh, invested in? It is. And really, it wasn't all at once. It was we bought the building. Well, so a really simple economic tool for an architect, I think, is on the building you're in, right? You pay for and so it's a really way, simple way to get started because it's cash flow and money that you're already going to have. So, you know, find a building that you can put your office in that you can renovate. You also get to create your own place in terms of design. You also get to create an identity for your company that people will see. So it, it scores on so many different places. But the first building we bought was a building uh, that we ended up putting our office in. The building next door had had a fire in it, so it was leaking into our building. So we ended up acquiring that. Two people heard that there's two guys stupid enough in Durham to be buying buildings, called them because they might buy your building. So people were like consciously getting rid of buildings in Durham at that point. So we looked up after two or three years and realized we own the whole neighborhood. And it wasn't like we had some big master plan to do that. But once we owned it, we were like, well, if we're going to be on this street, we should at least build the kind of street we want to live on and work on. And so we got to work with that. So what we would do is we acquired about eight or 10 buildings pretty quickly over a two or three year period. And every time we would like slow down in the architectural practice, we'd say, okay, let's, let's renovate this building this year. So, you know, we sort of did a building a year for about 10 years and, and now about two years ago, we finished off the last of them, um, have a, you know, terrific little portfolio of real estate as well as the architectural practice. So. Were those buildings already, did they have some tenants in them? Were they producing income? Oh, they really weren't. I mean, they technically did both, but they were pretty worthless. I mean, they were, you know, pretty tired businesses. Uh, they all became tax credit projects too, actually. That's where we kind of learned how to do the tax credit projects because uh, downtown Durham is an historic tax, uh, historic district. So made it relatively simple to do that. So we did that, learned that process. Uh, then we had to go out and get tenants. I and mean, we learned everything from the ground up. Like we had no idea what comps were. We had no idea how to work with banks. We had no idea what appraisals were. So, you know, it, it was... It, it's been a great experience and I think we're actually very good at it now, but we learned it from the ground up. So tenants were basically uh, restaurants. We had a key restaurant that really anchored the neighborhood. Uh, they're on a corner location, destination restaurant that kind of sparked the neighborhood. We then, because the buildings are rather small, I mean, they're about 3000 square foot floor plates two two and three story buildings um, startups turned out to be a great kind of company to put in that, right? Because startup um, wants a very short-term lease because they're going to either outgrow the space or in two or three years, they're going to figure out it's really not going to work. We need to get out of this lease. So, and we were very open to doing two and three-year kind of leases. And 
the kind of spaces you could design for startups needed to be very flexible, which made them easy to build and easy to rotate people through. So, and I love that it made the neighborhood very dynamic, right? You'd get different kind of tech companies rotating through these spaces and um, it's worked out well. And how did you manage the cash flow of, of having those properties and paying the mortgages on those things uh, if they weren't currently occupied or maybe they didn't have tenants? Uh, this is a great question, right? So, so I think of money as having these different states of matter, right? Like in an architecture practice, you're billing monthly, you've got money coming in, it's pretty good cash flow to it, right? It's, it's a pretty dynamic kind of flow. Real estate is like, frozen money. It just, you know, you spend it in big chunks and you, you pay it off in big chunks when you exit. So the real key to the real estate financing and that part of it was to line up financing for it, right? Once, once we'd sort of lined up financing, we were usually able to carry the product. We, we, we rarely had the projects fully leased when we started them. Um, you know, we just had enough kind of backlog of, of money around to be able to do it. It wasn't huge sums, but it was really starting to understand the the uh, the kind of the different types of money you have, whether it's money that's moving very quickly or real estate money that's moving slowly. Um, you know, the real key was learning how to work with banks and getting it financed early on. So, so did you, in those projects, did you use the cash flow from the firm to carry some of those notes or... Yeah, we, 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 we mixed that a little bit. So, um, you know, it's one of the advantages of having a pretty tightly held company. You know, I think that'd be harder to do in a bigger practice. Um, but yeah, we, we, we definitely would use the resources of one place for the other. We've always been very good about making sure that, again, our accounting is really pretty tight and pretty strict. And so, you know, making sure all the, all the entities, you know, are fair with one another. So. how much magnitude wise did you have to put into some of those early products trying to get a picture for, you know, were they kind of breaking even and you just maybe had to put a little bit here and there when, you know, the, one of the air conditioners went out or something like that, or where you guys put, you know, what sum of money would you be putting into monthly say on your first couple of projects? Uh, I would say most of them, the cash flow on them was probably, you know, four or $5,000 a month, you know, um, but I never felt like we were, I don't know, it's, it's, it's at a certain, when you get to, so when you get to the end of those projects and you've used most of your, your, uh, your credit or your financing, I always feel like the bank has more of a problem than you do, right? <laughs> because, you know, you've, you've kind of spent all their money. Um, but we've been fortunate in that we've been able to fill in the buildings before we ever got to a point in them where it seemed like we were holding an empty building. Right. And one of one of my good friends as a developer said the most expensive thing in the world is an empty building. Right. And so we learned pretty early on that you need to get pretty actively get tenants lined up and get people moving into the buildings, whether you're doing them as condos and selling them or whether you're leasing them. So leasing is a key component of, of real estate, no, no doubt. Um, and, and we've been pretty good about that. So. Tell, tell me about that, John. Why is leasing such a key component? Well, that's where your revenue is going to come from to, to hold the building, right? So you've got to be out there lining up tenants to do it. Um, it's where good relationships with the commercial real estate you know, entities and, and brokerage community matter because that's what they're in the business of doing. So, um, you know, that's what commissions are about. That's why you want to pay these people well and have them keep your buildings full. So. Now, earlier in, in so we're going to, obviously, we broke this episode up in the previous episode. Um, you, you mentioned right off the bat that you have, a, you believe in a strong accounting emphasis. I'd like you to tell me what you mean by that. Well, I, I think, and I, we are firm a lot of times too, right? Like, the, the, and I, it's funny, I was just at the AA convention, and everyone in the room, this room of 200 people talked about, no one wants to fill out timesheets. You know, so you just need to get people built into a culture where, look, if you can't, if you can't build this, there's no revenue for the company to work. So, you know, you want people to make sure they're doing the basics of that, but then the accounting functions are just, it's, it's your, it's your, it's your dashboard of understanding like how the business is doing health wise. And it's, 
if you do it well over a long period of time, you can start to see trends in it and look at the patterns in it and say, wow, we're spending a lot more money on business development this year. Why is that? Um, you know, rent for us has always been a great place to be able to park money because of the real estate interest we have, right? So let's say the architecture business is not as busy, but, you know, you're your real estate stuff's all pretty stable. You could say, well, let's, let's give the architecture firm a break on rent for three months so that we can, you know, go hire another person or go buy a plotter or whatever. So, and you won't know to do those things unless you have good accounting to, to understand that from. So it's funny. I never think of myself as like an accounting person. My dad's a physicist. So I just think I look at math as math and it's just another tool to, to work with. So it's, it's just a handy thing to know about. So, What reports are you looking at to get a picture of the finances of the business? Uh, I, look at a, I look at an AR report probably weekly. I look at uh, our uh, P&L, same kind of routine. I look at our balance sheet. The balance sheet usually is less important. I mean, that's more of a quarterly or yearly kind of thing. But P&L and, and AR reports I look at pretty constantly. I, you asked earlier about how we deal with things. So for years, I would deal with the AR report and I'd say, you know what? Everyone needs to know about this. So I kind of pushed that out to everyone as like, you know, you know, we, and we sort of call it dialing for dollars. Right? If our AR report gets kind of out of whack, I say, okay, we're going to, Monday is going to be dialing for dollars. Let's find out what's going on here. And and I, I bet nine times out of 10, what we find out, is that somebody didn't get an invoice or it went to the wrong desk or whatever. It's rarely that people are like in financial trouble and they're not going to pay you or there's some big disconnect. It's usually something didn't get to the right place. And, uh, you know, and, and so we try and stay on top of that pretty well. And you mentioned also you, you kind of keep your, your thumb on the business development pipeline. What are other important metrics, if any, that you're monitoring, John? Um, I don't know that I, I measure it, but uh, one thing I have observed is, uh, as a business has gone on is the expense of software in the practice today. And, and my observation on that is we're now writing pretty big checks for software and that a lot of the software companies have changed their model for that, where you used to be able to buy software and use it for three years. Well, now they're subscription-based. So that's, that's an expense that's really crept up. Um, and I, I've also observed in it, too, that as a profession, we're becoming almost beholden to the software, right? You're sort of, as people standardize on different platforms, um, one in particular I'm observing like it, it is now having, in my opinion, a, a much larger and outscaled influence into the way people put projects and drawings and everything together than I've ever seen before. And I don't know that it's good or bad. It's certainly different, right? It, it puts the weight of where you put your time on a project in different places, um, so that's one I observe, you know, and, and really that kind of flows up through accounting, right? You ask like, you know, what does accounting do for you? It's like when you start to see how much you're spending on software versus what you used to and say, wow, there's something different here. What is that? So, Yeah. So, John, just to wrap up here, what, what is a question that I haven't asked you that you think would be valuable for other firm owners that are looking to have a more fulfilling, scalable, profitable practice? I think one we didn't talk about was uh, the idea and design of designing for behaviors, right? How do you, how do you begin to design places that really begin to transform how a company works, how it builds culture? Um, and, and we describe that as kind of thinking more as anthropologist, right? Where you're really trying to understand, like, how do people really use a place? How do they use the space? How can a company, when they move from one place to another, use that as a strategic opportunity to rethink, well, if I had a new footprint to do this in, what would that place be, you know? And, and I would encourage people to really think about their buildings from how people are going to experience them, use them, and, and use them as strategic business tools. I think there's a huge opportunity. So. And when you say strategic business tool, what do you mean by that, John? 
Well, so let, let's say a company is going to, so some of the companies we've worked with have grown over time. They've spread out in two or three buildings and now they have a real estate decision coming up, right? They're going to move to a new place. They can take a step back and say, okay, we have a chance to really think about what it is as a business we want to accomplish in the next five to 10 years. What are the big business goals? And then we can design a building or a place that'll help support those, right? I think a lot of companies often make the mistake of taking what they were doing and just, you know, well, we think we're going to grow by 10% and just extrapolate that out. And I think they've missed a huge opportunity to step back and think strategically about, you know, what they want to do. And we as architects, how can we help them use design to get there? So that, that's what I mean by that. So give me an example of how you might use design to help a company achieve something like that. Well, so we worked with an ad agency here a couple of years ago, McKinney, that uh, was spread out over three or four floors. They moved from Raleigh to Durham into an old tobacco warehouse. And they, they consciously in the beginning of that project said, we want this to be a destination workplace. We want people when they walk in the door to say, this is a place I want to work in. Um, the other thing we did is we said, you know, we think the wire, the impact of a wireless world is going to transform the workplace. And how would that change the way we work, right? If you could work anywhere in this building at any time, how would that change? So we really integrated, you know, different office settings, different venues, coffee areas, food, uh, roof decks into that design and did that very consciously up front. You know, it was really thinking about like how technology would impact the workplace and designing that into it. Um, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, John, it's, it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. Thank, yeah, thank you fun. for sharing your insights with us. A lot of fun. So keep it up. Great work. Thanks, John. All right. And that's a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to register for my next upcoming online training on how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk. To discover how to market your firm to win the kind of projects and clients that you want to be working with and on, sign up for my next free design firm marketing training at architectwebinar.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances, both in the office and on the go with a beautiful and easy to use mobile app. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.